Welcome to the latest in NCP series of webinars and interviews. Today, our special guests are Liz Simi and Paula Glick, co-founders of Honey Tree Investment Management, a Toronto-based boutique investment manager. Before we get rolling, though, a quick imp and important disclaimer that nothing you hear today should be taken as investment advice. We do these sessions to educate, inform, and maybe even provide some entertainment. We hope, hope you enjoy it. But I'll, I'll start off by asking Liz and Paula to tell us a little bit about their background and the firm that they founded, Honey Tree. Take it, take it away. Okay, I'll start. Uh, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Russ, for doing this. And uh, I think it's you know interesting to for you and, and for us to be able to explore ESG together. Uh, I came from the investment industry uh, about 20 years ago. I got involved in the ESG space. Uh, it was really looking for a way to connect the dots from my personal values uh, and within the investment industry. Having worked in the investment industry for a number of years, I started to look around and learned about what we called socially responsible SRI at the time and uh, got very excited by it and jumped out of the investment industry uh, in the portfolio management space that I was working in and decided to focus on learning more about ESG research and working with all sorts of uh, allocators, asset managers, asset owners, pension plans, foundations, and helping them, uh, and in, in turn learning and educating myself on the merits and the value of looking at environmental and social issues and how companies should govern themselves with these considerations in, in, in place as a way to drive at both uh, improving company performance and uh, investment performance and also changing uh, the world, as they say. Uh, yep. So that, that this whole area just really kind of excited me. And um, I spent 14 years uh, in part at Sustainalytics and then at MSCI, uh, both in this ESG capacity, uh, looking, you know, learning and 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 focusing on integration of ESG not only from a research perspective but from a risk uh, management as well as uh, index application perspective uh, and uh, Liz and I met and um, that was the 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 obvious next phase for me was the back full circle into the investment management space but with my ESG knowledge in 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 in, in uh, tandem and uh, being able to develop and and um, establish something of my own and with with Liz, of course. Um, yeah. And that's that sort of brings us to here where we are today. I uh, I do not have an ESG background. Um, I have an investment background and the entire time I was in the investment world, I worked at a small Toronto based firm called Bristol Gate. I I, as Paula mentioned earlier, I was looking for that additional purpose, right? It, it, and trying to understand how my training in nonprofit stakeholder governance and volunteer work and just general existence um, could be kind of tied into investing. And, and that's that's when Paula and I met and we realized there were um, a lot of big firms were missing the mark on ESG products, the, the mutual funds and ETFs available. There wasn't enough, we'll call it ones that met the end consumer need. Um, and we felt there was room for innovation in the ESG space, um, in the public markets. So the, the stock, the world of stocks. And we realized there were very few woman owned firms in Canada or the world. Um, and we're, we, in fact, realized there was only three other asset managers owned by women in Canada, and we really didn't have a choice. We had to start the fourth firm because, the, you know, the, the, if we didn't, with our qualifications and experience, who was going to? Um, and we both thought it was a good idea to launch uh, an asset management firm from scratch. I was lucky in that I'd seen it already, so we kind of knew what the, the, you know, growth from zero to we'll call it a couple billion one day will be yeah. um, and all the, the things that were required. So we decided to to take the risk and we've just passed our three year track record and begun to get institutional traction, which was always our main goal. Um, 
uh, although our, our ultimate goal is to be have a, a product available for the people. Um, so we're kind of trying to work on that as well. But really, we manage uh, portfolios based on responsible growth. So we use ESG data in addition to financial data to, to pick concentrated portfolios of the most responsibly growing companies in the world. Um, in our, you know, we believe stakeholder governed, purpose driven companies outperform in the long run. Um, that's really what we're 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 using ESG data for, and we think we just think the ESG data we use is operational data, and the companies we invest in also consider it op operational data. And we're, we're going to talk about uh, our thoughts and beliefs on ESG <laughs> today, which is we both have very yeah. strong opinions on them. But you know, we didn't see that many firms taking the fully integrated approach that we have, and we believed that there's a need for this. Um, uh, in all parts of the market. Cool. So ESG re regulations, greenwashing, it, it's all been the news. The The Economist had a piece on it uh, this week. And I, and I know it, obviously it's a subject that's dear, dear to your hearts. Liz, you've been very active on Twitter about some of the shortcomings of ESG. It's, it's either currently practiced or probably more accurately marketed. Um, so I'll start, start, start with you. Um, question. ESG, good or bad? As you just said, ESG is good. Caring about worker safety, caring about dumping toxic stuff into the lakes and streams, um, mitigating that, companies that do investment strategies that do is good. But so uh, the investment industry, well, trying to do some good stuff doesn't realize that it also applies to them. And so I'm relatively outspoken on Twitter because Paula and I, we want our competitors to truly care about the diversity of their teams. We want their competitors to, 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 to you know, understand the, um, we want the entire investment ecosystem to evolve with this. But, it, you know, as, as one may expect, the investment industries um, a little old school and a little more financials focused. And sometimes what happens and, and what greenwashing is, is, is that end client seeing a disconnect between the products that are offered and the, the decisions that are made and what the institutions offering those products are doing versus what they're promising in their marketing. And so we're, we're happy to be guides to, to advisors and institutions and even our competitors um, on on that disconnect, because I don't think the industry is doing it on, entirely on purpose, right? I think yep. you know we 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 forget that most of the investment industry is um, more urban, uh, more you know uh, affluent, a little more disconnected from you know reality, and we 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 need to connect to reality to solve the world's problems and not leave it all just to philanthropy. So that's in a in a very complicated nutshell why I'm so active on Twitter kind of it's I kind of I think Pal and I are in a unique situation to communicate kind of these these barriers and these this discrepancies between all these ESG products launched by all these large asset managers and big banks globally and and you know real change and an impact in the public and the private markets yeah yeah Paula, you, you, you've, your, your experience has been a little bit different because you've spent, was it 14 years between Sustainalytics and the MSCI, the, the data providers that so many investment managers rely on. Um, yeah. I take it as, as business partners, your, your thoughts align, but any different nuances that you can offer on ESG, good, bad, indifferent? Well, it, 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 that's, it's very interesting because my, my history uh, brought me along through this valuable offering of an ESG rating and what yeah. the, the methodology was trying to do, what it what it endeavors to uncover and how you can use it. Um, and more importantly, you know, it was the, you know, as, as there was an evolution, it was like, how did that ESG rating uh, evolve in terms of, 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 philosophy not just methodology but also as again the esg rating is only as good in a sense as to what is being made available uh from a from a data perspective so as companies got more and more aware and we're still 
you know, struggling yeah. with consistency and clarity and, um, you know, which companies are more on board on these issues. So ESG, absolutely good. Uh, it's just, it's very complex world. And yeah. I think, I think as people start to understand, as we do, that really it's just fundamental data. It's is you want to know as much as you can about the companies that you're investing yep. in, and clearly the financial side of the equation is not enough. Uh, and these these in some you know senses intangibles and how they impact, um, you know, that's the two sides yep. of the coin needs to be understood. And but when we come back to the investment management side and the the greenwashing. I think there's also this this uh, notion of intentionality that to me, I always just come back to it because, you know, there's folks out there and we used to, you know, in the ESG ratings world, yeah, you know, we would sell it on the basis of this is a great thing to market because this is a great asset gatherer for you. Uh, nothing to do with, you know, do you believe in it? Do, do, yeah. do you care about these issues? And I think that that's one of the the. The, the, the distinguishing factors is, is how much do you intentionally care? And so, and also there's issues around asset classes, right? So it's like public equities, which is in some ways the easiest place is also the most difficult place to have impact. Whereas, you know, in privates where you can directly invest in affordable housing. Yes. You know, yeah. it, it just, it resonates much more deeply. Whereas when you're investing in public equity companies, your investments are as good as the companies that you're in. We know how difficult it is for companies to truly make a difference. And so, you know, again, Liz and I are so focused and concentrated. We only invest in 20 to 30 companies across all our strategies uh, because there aren't that many companies out there actually really um, intentionally uh, and that meet both financial and ESG combined considerations that meet our requirements. And that can relate to impact um yeah. that that discussion around impact and but for us it's about intentionality within the investment manager themselves mm -hmm. and, and what they're actually trying to achieve uh and then how that's conveyed in the in the investment um process and um yeah i guess you know and i'm i'm, I'm thinking of <clears throat> partly thinking of the uh article that uh, that was in the economist which i thought was actually quite poor i was very disappointed pointing out article because I don't I think they completely missed miss the boat on it that's my my opinion but there's really you know it, I guess in my experience or my thought process there's two ways of, of approaching the whole ESG question one is from a values pr perspective and often that's where individual clients will come from is I want something that's going to align with my values from a portfolio manager's point of view you know as I went through it through the journey of actually you know embracing ESG as as part of my investment process it was I have values but my values are not necessarily an investable uh, thing and it does not necessarily uh, mesh with with the values of, of my clients so I'm going to set those aside for, for a second and then look at ESG as a risk management tool and I think for a lot of portfolio managers um, I won't say they justify it, but they look at it at, as a risk management tools because those things, whether it's uh, environmental, social, or and especially governance, um, are all potential risks to to a company. And uh, so I think there are there are two different ways ways to to, to approach it. Um, but Paul, just staying with you, you for a sec, um, we we've, we've seen the whole space evolve. I mean, one can go back to the late 1800s and the very first uh, socially responsible investments that was brought forth by, um, I think it was the Quakers had the first ones and then evolved through to what became socially responsible investment, uh, to responsible investing, to ESG. How have you seen, see, how, how have you experienced or seen the evolution in your career? I mean, it's been, you know, from I came from it from a values perspective. So yeah. it was very much about, you know, it made perfect sense to exclude certain industries that didn't align with your personal values. It, it made perfect sense to want to even apply like a best of sector if you were, you know, I mean, that that's a construct of 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 our focus in the investment industry in general, which is, you know, index benchmarked. Uh, weights. So we think, oh, we need to own all industries. But, you know, it was it, it all of it made very much sense to me, more so from a values based perspective, 
But to me, it's two sides of the same coin. And I really, I think it gets very complicated when you try to, um, you know, to to separate out, you know, it's just, just a risk mitigation yeah. tool. I think it's one and the same. The reason it is a risk mitigation tool is because it actually does impact um, from a, from a, from a, <laughs> You know, you can you can you can put a, a a lens of values on this risk mitigation, right? Whether it's pollution, toxic waste, uh, carbon emission mitigation, uh, social issues, uh, uh, pay equity, um, family values, and not to be confused with <laughs> pro anything, um, you know. But you know, all all of these considerations, diversity and inclusion, all of these things, these are considered risk and opportunities, um, but they're also values. And I just think that 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 aligning of the two sides uh, needs to sort of happen. And that's why I think there's a, and, and I think that that evolution is happening more and more that there's this notion that, you know, and companies will be rewarded for these types of practices, these types of ways of making their business more efficient, um, understanding the value of their people and empowering that and making them for a very successful and productive team. All of these things, they're, they're one in the same. Um, so the evolution has been very interesting. Um, I think even my evolution with Liz and us going out yep. on a limb and doing this on our own is part of the ESG evolution as, as women founding our own asset manager uh, and leading with a whole ESG mindset uh, around everything that we do, whether it's in our business proper and in our investments is very much aligned with where the world of ESG is going. And it's, it's, it's no longer, you know, just... It, yeah. it, it was more simplistic uh, earlier on. It's getting a lot more nuanced and we can do a lot more even, you know, just ESG ratings put aside. ESG ratings existed for a reason. There was so much that had to be estimated or assumed or or a knowledge that you could apply because the data didn't exist. Today, we can take the data ourselves more and more and we can make sense of it ourselves uh, and, and uh, make good decisions both financial and that combine ESG into our own stock selection process without a rating. Yeah. And I, I would say, you know, I, I think the the ratings have become a little bit of a red herring. Um, I, the, because, because it's an easy go-to, you know, for, uh, for somebody that doesn't have the capacity in to internally, just look at, oh, there's a rating. I, I can apply that. And, yeah, and it's it's Quite, helpful. And claim. Just, it's just, it's helpful, but but it doesn't do the deep dive. Right. Well, it's the yeah. same as sell side ratings, right? Yeah. Buy sell holds have been around forever. And I can't yeah. tell you in my early days before I got into ESG, I worked in quite a few buy side and sell side institutions and how people relied on the buy side of those equity analyst uh ratings or you know, yeah. um, without doing their own deep dives. And there was a yeah. lot of that's what kind of turned me uh, off of working in the industry proper at that time and decided, <laughs> yeah. you know, I want to align values because I saw a lot of sort of this insider trading um, kind of mindset, this yeah. lack of depth, this lack of real understanding of what companies were actually doing on the ground. And, um, and so that notion of relying on a rating has been around in the financial side of the equation for, the, yeah. for way, way longer. And everybody turns to ESG and says, oh, you're, you know, you're looking at a rating and, you know, it's not, you know, and, and it's going to limit your universe and all these other arguments as to why ESG shouldn't be considered yet. You know, just looking at the financial side of the equation and how we've been doing investing for a long time is mired in, in lots of issues. So yeah. it doesn't, yeah. doesn't hold up. As, and there's a lot we, of mis, misunderstanding around ESG. Back to your yes. Economist article, which yeah. I've read so much recently, and I can't point to specifically that article. Yeah. It's the one that said we should just use emissions and throw everything else out. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. which is just, yeah. don't even, I could talk about that alone for two hours. Yes, you could. <laughs> <laughs> the... um. And Liz, but you, so you came to ESG a little bit later than uh, than Paula, and um, so your evolution. But I, I, what what are the changes that have really st stood out for you as as we've gone down gone down this this path? 
My first ESG experience, I would argue I lived by ESG even without knowing what it was in my, I was raised in, I don't know, an ESG household before it existed. But I remember in our portfolio, a client um, asked why one of these companies was in the portfolio to the CIO. And I, I, at the same time, was like, yeah, why is that company in there does bad things? doesn't matter what those things are. It it had controversies, we'll say. And the answer was, well, because of financials. And so the insight there wasn't that, and, and this is, I knew nothing about E, S, and G. I knew nothing about ratings. I knew nothing about what even Sustainalytics or MSCI was. This would have been in, I don't know, 2015, 2016. But the insight there from both the client and myself was, these bad things that the company is doing are an investment risk. Not only do I dislike them, not only are they negatively impacting the world and I don't want to be part of it, I think they're an investment risk. And so I think a lot of ESG in its early evolution only cared about the consumer insight for the first two. And for in, in because of the way the traditional investment industry has been and still operates, it doesn't believe these things that negatively impact humanity are an investment risk when they are. And so the I will call it the final bridge to ESG integration is, you know, underpaying employees may save you, may make your financials look better in the short term. In the long term, you know, when shit hits the fan, like, I don't know, a pandemic, you may have issues retaining and hiring people. Right. And I think that's the 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 insight that we used in, in, you know, in combination with the data that's available and the, the you know, our values um, to, to build a truly integrated portfolio. Um, and what we what we do is we say, you know, a lot of traditional finance theory is based on shareholder primacy, that the only purpose of an organization is to enrich its shareholders. And a lot of the investment industry believes that and we believe the purpose of an organization is to govern on behalf of its stakeholders and that by doing that and by enriching its employees and customers and, and providing positive good products and not i don't know hurting them stealing from them paying you know all, all those things that uh, a, a company can do will lead to long-term outperformance and and you know, e ESG is and should be about an impact, should be about long term focus, the short termism of the investment industry, the daily reporting on you know prices and the quarterly reporting is. Is the antithesis of ESG, and so a lot of folks, you know, a lot of I find a lot of investment professionals believe in caring about the environment and, you know, equal pay and all this stuff in the real world, but they have an issue integrating it into their financial models that are focused on shareholder primacy. So there's this kind of you can see this kind of bouncing back and forth, um, even even at folks in, in ESG firms, right? You know, it, it, and that's where ratings or, or best of sector come in. They are financial models primary and their ESG considerations are secondary or tertiary. And for us, it was important for the ESG considerations to be equal to the financial considerations in in a true ESG integration framework. Oh, you're muted. So, no, yeah, I just saw that. So, so, so there, there, there's three, three letters, and according to the Economist article, there's only one we should worry about it, and we should change it from environment to emissions. Um, <laughs> of the three, environment, social governance, which is the most important, or, or, is it yeah. a choice? So well, I'm going to answer go the they're all the, the assumption that everything fits nicely in a bucket is completely flawed. Everything um, the, the best way to look at it is financial data and non financial data, all of which is fundamental data. And when you try and bucket it, you separate it from financials. First of all, you assume it's easily goes into to each bucket um, when in fact, the, the useful data um, in the ESG side 
is fundamental data. And it, it's just like the use, not all financial data is useful. Um, the useful financial data is fundamental company data. And the, the bucketing has done a disservice because everybody's trying to find specific metrics that fit nicely in buckets when they all overlap. Um, you know, and that's one of the big problems with the climate only folks is they, they the, the climate only, which is a big chunk of ESG, by the way, um, thinks that, you know, uh, income inequality, poverty, turnover, low pay has nothing to do with emissions when in fact they're completely related. Um, just like good governance is entirely tied in um, to all of the buckets if you were to choose the buckets. So it's, it, it's you know, the, the buckets grew up the way they did because uh, Sustainalytics and MSCI and all the, the researchers had to organize the data in some way. It was organized separate from financials, although I'd argue it's going to be in financials, uh, whether anybody likes it or not, um, in the next decade. And and as you can imagine, there were lots of portfolio managers out there who did not want to touch any of this data or the rating, and they wanted it to be kept separate from financials. So what we're seeing now is a move towards, and you can look at the SEC, the regulation in Canada, Europe, but the SEC's recent in particular, where the emissions data moves from a sustainability report to a financial report. So in the next couple of years, scope one and two emissions will be reported by public issuers in their financials um, and be audited as a result. And I don't think five years ago, I think five years ago, that ESG industry and the investment industry thought that they would always remain separate. You'd have a robust sustainability reporting framework that was separate, but what we're seeing now is um, is an actual integration of the data reporting, and it's it's being driven a little bit by the regulators, but it's the companies themselves who are hiring auditors, hiring experts. They want to catch up. They don't want to be a laggard in reporting basic diversity data and environmental yeah. data and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's not just like I think the investment industry thinks we're all in charge of stuff, but it's not. It's really um, it, it's really the corporations and the regulators and their end clients. Um, it, it's it's a fascinating thing to kind of watch live as the whole kind of mess is dismantled and reorganized because that's that's what's happening right now. Yeah, Paula. No, I, I yeah, I was just going to say that the, the diversity side of the equation too, right? Like workforce yeah. data, um, the the you know the the board diversity requirements that are really coming yeah. to the fore that you know all of that should be disclosed it should be part of you know a kind of integrated report or you know part of the financials right because we just want this data to be aligned and integrated yeah. one one set of data so that you can sort of piece it all together it's the same as when we you know we're we're using this ESG research over here and this fundamental data over here and then we got to like you know, it's just like, let's have it all because all of it is valuable. And that's how we use it. We integrate, you know, our decision making isn't around financials first, ESG second. It's really they both matter equally, um, particularly on the measures that we feel really drive, you know, um, drive our decision making. And yeah. they're 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 equal. So yeah. we need them. we need them together and ideally in an audited format. So we know that it's it's legit. Um, that it's realized the goals and the actual changes year over year is what's really important to us. Our companies truly, you know, you can you can state a goal, uh, you know, for 2030, 2050. Um, how is it achievable? Is it really achievable? Are we seeing the results? And that's that's what we're really looking for. And it's across the board. So yeah. which one's more important? I mean, obviously, the E right now is so pressing. And I just find it so amazing that when I talk to people on the street, I mean, a lot of people just aren't talking about climate change. I still, I am still <laughs> blown away in the sense that, you know, it's like, it's facing us, it's getting more and more severe every minute and people are still, you know, either yeah. in denial or really just hasn't sunk in or it's not really impacting them on a very personal level so that they're kind of just, you know, and I, and I understand that. And I also yeah. understand that it's very hard to, to consume or digest doom and gloom. Um, but you know, and then of course, and then the S side, as Liz said, is is extremely interconnected, and and you know needs to be constantly addressed. Um, so it's it's more of a of a consistent non. You know, we just we've got to continue driving toward a level 
of equality and equity, um, more inclusion as the world becomes more diverse, as we have, you know, more and more, you know, there just has to be greater awareness uh, and acceptance um, and movement in, in, in all areas, whether it's yeah. to gender equality, racial equality, um, and all of these things will drive positive uh, results in the economy and for companies. And it's a race to it's a race to who's more progressive in that sense, um, because it's going to benefit. Yeah. Um, so it's a values and material concern in one, and like like all the issues are. And um, yeah, so it, it's yeah. it's not it's not it's not easy to say one is more important than the other. Obviously, yeah. in governance is that big umbrella, so yeah. everything fits under governance. However, you yeah. want to bucket it. That's yeah. our I, our new version of the bucket is environmental data and workforce data and financials tell you whether a company is well governed or not. And arguably all the metrics feed into good governance or not. Um, and and so that's that's our kind of new version of ESG is ESF equals G. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Yeah, I'd see, I, I, I would argue that the most, if, if we were gonna pick one of those letters, the most important one is governance. If you don't get the governance right, nothing else is going to follow. Um, but the, uh, the governance, I mean, just like the world of ESG, it's it's an evolving, it's evolving, yes, right? Yes, the, the, absolutely. All the credentials of the people at the uh, on the board, you know, have yep. traditionally been very financially <clears throat> driven, yep. right? Experiences or marketing, finances, yep. operations, uh, and more and more. There's this need to see some ESG knowledge, some ESG expertise to drive these decisions from the top down. And yeah. so we're seeing that just as in the ESG space with ESG analysts in the investment world, in the pension plans, there's more and more people yeah. getting into it that come from very different backgrounds, but are, are, are gaining this knowledge as this world of ESG becomes more mainstream, more integrated, yeah. uh, and greater awareness to being able to call it ESG, right? It's, it's, it's always been yeah. done, but as we get more and more knowledgeable and sophisticated even yeah. on it um we need to see that g being you know yeah harnessed. the uh, yeah the um you know that 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 whole concept of diversity with it at both at the board board level and and, and in the c suite is in in my mind so critical because i mean it, it's been it's been empir empirically proven time and time again that you know diverse boards or diverse board um uh groups of decision makers make better decisions because there's there's uh there's more there's more nuance brought into the discussions different points of view um uh risks and things that one person may not have seen or downplayed where another per person can turn around and say you know what that is a risk and this and the and these are the reasons why so uh yeah i i, I would still put g, g at the top but i i, I totally get you that if it, it's just math, math in reverse. Good yeah. governance equals good environment, good social, good yeah, financials. and that's and we wrap it all up in stakeholder governance, right? Yeah. So how do you how do you pick a company that's stakeholder governed? Well, because the and stakeholder governance is the good governance. There you could yeah. you know uh, the the age of the board members and their tenure and their independence might be an indicator of stakeholder governance, but the actions, the pay levels, the you know, dealing with controversies, disclosure of contra, all these things, um, ability to grow free cash flow, all these things are symptoms of good governance. Um, and I'd argue every single one of our measures is assessing that we use, both financial and non, is assessing the quality of governance, the long-term focus and the stakeholder focus of the boards. And, and that's that's entirely our thesis. And yeah. Um, which is why it gets complicated trying to describe it into three buckets because we don't use those buckets. We don't yep. have any E, S, and G measures. We just have measures in our yeah. in the, that are financial and non. Yeah. So slightly changing the topic, not totally, slightly change, change, change the topic here. Greenwashing, it's out there, it's real. We see it. How do you recognize it? And and how, and what should, uh, what should an end, end client do? Um, I'm thinking more more at the uh, at the private client, the retail level. What should they be looking for to recognize when something's being greenwashed? 
there's a few things we already sort of touched on them. For okay. me, it's intentionality. So I think it's also looking at the portfolio managers, the firm. What are they about from a from an from an ESG DNA perspective? I think that's mm -hmm. one of the really important things. I think also regulation is going to change that. There's more and more discussion um, at the SEC level in terms of and Canada better disclosure and Europe, of course, <laughs> better yeah. disclosure uh, around ESG processes. What does that really mean? Looking at the prospectuses, that's going to be a, a first step for for a lot of folks because right now. The greenwashing and where we've seen some stuff uncovered is that they're they're over promising under delivering in terms of what is really under the hood and the whole the whole effort from the SEC right now, because there's a, um, a submission, an open submission right now for um, more disclosure from investment managers. Uh, and from companies is all about being able to get in there and really understand so that transparency from managers is going to be super key uh, in order to be able to really understand, like, are they really doing? And and we saw, you know, some of those um, SEC moving in on some of these large asset managers saying that, you know, their process actually didn't really line up with what yeah. they say they're doing. So, you know, the, the retail investor might have a hard time being able to go in there and seeing what the process yeah. is, but a lot of that should be uncovered in in their prospectus uh, yeah. and in their ADVs and in the, the the required documentation. So that's I think a really important thing. I think from an from an individual perspective and knowing what you're kind of looking for, there's a lot of disconnect. People see, you know, they're looking at a at a strategy or a fund and they see companies in there that don't resonate. Like Liz's story early on, you might see oil and gas companies or certain mining companies that have reputational baggage yeah. or the you know some of these uh newer tech companies that you might have itch, issue with or electric car companies and so on and so forth <laughs> people might have issue with um yeah. so it's about paying attention and but also understanding what is the underlying philosophy of this of this fund and what are they really trying to achieve yeah. how do they do that yeah um i i, I think to be you know um Greenwashing and ESG and greenwashing isn't the only area where uh, companies don't always deliver what what they say that they're going we're going they're going to deliver. I mean, we've seen that time and time again, where somebody purports to be a value manager or a growth manager, and all of a sudden you look at the portfolio and saying, yeah, that stuff doesn't actually line up. Yeah. Yeah. Or okay. or. Yeah. A lot somebody, of, somebody that claims to be an active manager and turns out to be a clo closet in indexer is probably the, the classic. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think that's where folks, uh, there's a lot of attacks on ESG right now, calling the SEC and the regulators woke, you know, and values focused. But the idea, you know, if you're if you have a dividend strategy and you're saying in your prospectus that you're using, you know, high dividend yield or high dividend growth, in your process and you're selling that to clients you should be using it just like if you're using emissions or you're using diversity data in your marketing material to make and saying that you integrate it into your portfolio you should be actually doing that so the regulators are not making a, a values or a judgment decision um, in the case of the SEC specifically they're they're not saying anybody even has to use ESG data at all but they're saying if you do claim to use it, which, you know, the majority of asset managers now claim to use it because they all signed the PRI, then you yeah. should be using it, not yes. just using it for marketing purposes. So I actually think the regulation, um, while lots of folks are screaming and crying that the SEC is getting into to values, they're not. They're 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 doing their job, which is investment claims or investment claims whether they're about financial data or non-financial data and asset managers advisors institutions giant pensions should be doing what they're disclosing from a regulatory stance and if they're not they should get in trouble for it um as opposed to the you know it's not about esg being good or bad just like it's not about dividends being good or bad or value being good or bad or, or growth it's about our job, they're the regulator's job to make sure our disclosures as an industry aren't lying to the end client. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. So is there any way that other than, other than 
I guess, just educating themselves? How, how do investors push back against it and help help clean it up? Or is this really in the hands of the regulators right now? Uh, so I think I think investors are already I think some investors are already trying to clean it up and yeah. they whether they're an individual or a, uh, a giant pension, they're asking these questions. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, you say you integrate X, Y, Z. How do you do that is a great way to ask a manager or to get your advisor to ask the manager um, is a great way to, you know, and they'll disclose how they look at emissions data, other environmental data, diversity data, you name it, just like they would from a, a financial perspective. But I think, and we've alluded to this a couple of times, it's about driving change in the system. So when we talk to an advisor or an institution, they say, all of my clients have been asking for this. All of my clients are concerned about greenwashing and they're looking for this. Same thing with big consultants. And so, um, you know, a lot of advisors need education on this. A lot of advisors want to build ESG portfolios or ESG integrated portfolios for their end client. Um, but they also, I mean, and this is about end customer demand. Right. This is this is never about us as an industry just making up a whole bunch of yeah. cool products that we think are cool that aren't going to resonate with investors. Um, and we're really good at that, by the way, as an industry. Like we're really great at creating ETFs and funds that go yeah. nowhere, just to be super clear, because it's not even just sales ability. It's they don't meet the end customers needs. So end customers, whether you're CPPIB or a very small retail investor, need to ask these questions. Um, and it gets tricky, I guess, if you're a self-directed investor, but, you know, the, 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 you know, the, one of the, one of the big mechanisms for change in ESG is engagement, right? And so big pensions and asset managers will go to corporations and say, you need to do X, Y, Z. And the same thing is true for retail investors to the managers and to the advisors, right? I want to invest in a uh, fund managed by women. Right. And there are not very many funds managed by women. But the more clients ask, the more you know investment committees talk about diversity of suppliers, the more change is going to happen. The more we'll figure out a way to get beyond one percent of assets managed by women and diverse owned firms in the world. Right. And so there, but that's true of the teams at large asset managers. Right. The more pressure that big institutional investors put on the big asset managers in Canada, the more diverse their teams will get, the better their teams will, you know, be conscious of their own emissions, the, you know, better governance they'll have, right? So it's, it's the whole things, it's all about systems change from, from the security selection level to the product level, to the firm level, to the supplier level. Um, and, and we have to change the whole thing. We can't just solve the problem with a couple of great cool products and a little bit of emissions reductions and and move on um it really is uh it, it takes everybody to 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 really kind of shift where 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 we need to be very much so yeah and it is a shift it's a shifting thing because you have already so many established investment managers with you know hundreds of products on the shelf yeah you know and now all of a sudden they want to be esg um, and there's a disconnect between, yep. you know, the 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 one or two products that they've that they've, you know, built that's specific to ESG, and then all the rest of it that sort of got some ESG integration going on. And how do you, how do you sort of deal with that? Um, yeah. That's sort of the complexity. Um, and so, as you know, absolutely, they should be able to take ESG data and be able to integrate it across their products. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's also a rebranding thing. It's a reputational yeah. thing. It's, and how, again, it comes back to my sort of notion of intentionality. It's like, how important is this data actually to you? How are you using it? How can you make everything that you have? Uh, and that's why Honey Tree was born because we didn't want to just go into another firm and create a, a, a strategy within a company that doesn't, that doesn't have the, the overarching philosophy of ESG, um, or sustainability as part of their 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 thinking, um, yeah. and so we wanted to make sure that that was, you know, a very fulsome um, aspect to er everything that we do and think about. And that's I think that's one of the things is like there aren't that many firms out there that wholeheartedly 
think, you know, breathe, live, work in that kind yeah. of capacity. I mean, nobody's perfect and no, no, you know, and, and again, we're in public <laughs> equity and I always come back to the fact that, you know, you talked about your own personal values and maybe trying to put certain things aside and try to work for the client, but also just in my own personal hopes, wishes, dreams, I want our strategies and I to be, you know, much further ahead in terms of, you know, my notion of our notions of responsible growth and what's achievable in the, the in the world of, of running a large company and how stakeholder, how well governed they are is 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 never, you know, it's not always living up. But there's no such thing as a perfect company. So we're always having to make, I guess, sacrifices and, and kind of make sense of, of things in terms of, you know, how we're but as much as possible in terms of, you know, how we think about these things, what we're driving to effect that change uh, is really what's key. And, you know, you're not going to, yeah. you know, it gets harder it, it, the bigger yeah. you are. It's, it's really about informed choices, isn't it? The, um, yes. Yeah. The, the, the other thing that you touched on briefly, and, and, and I don't want to go on to it, go on to it too far, but, uh, you know, when I was doing my responsible investment courses through the PRI and that, you know, one of the key tenets of ESG or maybe more properly called responsible investing was the whole idea of engagement. And for for a small shop, it's really hard. I mean, who's going to listen to somebody? Well, we own 2000 shares of Google or Apple or whatever it is. How much impact can you have? How, you know, how how close to the C-suite or the or the board can you get? But certainly for the for the pension funds, for the large institutional managers, that um, that engagement, you know, as shareholders, because as shoulder, shareholders we own the company, that engagement becomes re- really really important. I mean, that's I, I think that's how real change is is, is often driven, I and mean, we just saw that um, with uh, Elliott Management and. Um, Suncor uh, and Suncor, you know, I mean, they drove real change, mm-hmm. and but that was through through engagement at at the board level and and at, and and with the uh, with with the C suite. And like for example, if you are a pension that is union members in a pension, and you've got billions of dollars, which is many institutional allocators in North America and globally. And you're investing in a company that is fighting against unionization, you are literally investing in your downfall, right? And so it's it's there's you know the the engagement purposes and the role of institutional allocators of all sizes uh, and retail investors in enacting change, whether it's for the worst absolute like worst companies in the world, like I remember when the the California pension went to visit the private prisons to see if they could make the private prisons better. I mean, arguably, you can make private prisons better. You can make tobacco companies better. You know, the apartheid was stopped in part because of these corporate actions. And, and, and it, so so it, there, there is a huge space for engagement. At the same time, there's also a some folks just don't want to hold companies that they need to change a bunch. And that's where our strategy comes from, which is our companies can all improve. They've all got giant problems. They all do stupid things, just like people. Nobody's perfect. But, you know, we're if we if we have to, um, uh, you know, if we have to be an, we're not we're not activists. But, you know, there there there's there it, all of these parts. of And again, systems change. Right. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, you can't just change the board and add a couple women on the board and say, boom, we've changed diversity in a corporation it's much bigger than that and it involves all parts all parts of the industry from the smallest retail investor to the biggest institution from ESG integration and security selection to engagement to proxy voting to um, peer pressure you know uh, from each of the companies trying to have more robust sustainability reports it's all it's all integrated and that's why public markets companies do make an impact. Um, you know, that's why it's not up to governments and philanthropy to solve the world's problems. These companies, these large companies have a huge role in this yeah. system's change, arguably the largest. We certainly saw that in the states with um, certain companies pulling out of certain states as certain laws were passed. And they said, right. no, we're not. Yeah. You know, so 
companies can well, they, can have, have can have an impact, but it's up to also to shareholders, I guess, to to help drive that through yeah. through yeah, proper I, I mean, on engagement. The company side, they have huge impact also because just the nature of them in terms of driving their supply chain, in terms of you know their employee base, which yep. can be tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people. How that impacts in the economy where they operate, how they deal with, um, you know, obviously their like the whole stakeholder. Uh, equation, you know, it's 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 extremely impactful, positively or negatively. So, um, but I was going to say something on the on the um, manager side, and I just lost my train of thought. Oh, it no. happens. It happens to all. It happens to me all the time. Oh yeah. Oh no. It was about engagement. Um, uh, there's a cynical side to me, which is that uh, you know, and I think why our strategy works for us. Uh, you know, and we are small and we can't really, you know, we don't have a huge um, personnel to do yeah. massive engagement. Um, but there's also a, another side that I think, you know, and it it's complex because if you're a universal owner, if you're a large pension plan, you're going to own everything. You can't yeah. afford to be moving in out, out of companies that you just, you know, don't agree with. So you're sort of in a forced place to engage. I mean, that's what you should have your team ready to engage with all these companies. But I think it's also an excuse for some who say, you know, I want to own oil and gas. I want to own certain industries that, you know, or I want to own the market. I want to own all the sectors. So I'm going to engage with them. But you know that inherently the nature of that business, you know, or tobacco, yeah. you know, whatever, yeah. whatever the example may be, is just uh, inherently, there's nothing that you can really engage on. Okay, change your yeah. entire business model so yeah. that you can be, um, you know, I mean, maybe with oil and gas, there is some transitioning that can happen to renewables and so on and so forth. But still, there's that inherent reality of the business case. And, and, um, and so I just think, you know, do you want to own it? Uh, and if so, yeah. then own it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but don't. But but engagement is sort of a fallback excuse, I think, in, in the ESG space. You know, which yeah. is better to own it or divest? If you divest, you're giving other countries that are more problematic ownership over those. You know, that make it make yeah. it even worse. And it's this whole sort of balancing act. And yes, there's there's a there's an argument, but I also yeah. think that there's a it's kind of a little bit of a Excuse. So, I have to ask, what about that Elon guy? So the the we wrote our last blog on this. I think I haven't put it up on the website yet, but I will um, before this this show. So we have very strict qualification criteria, which includes investment grade, above investment grade, yeah, investment grade credit rating or above. And so we just don't even look at companies below and Tesla is one of those companies, whereas you may find uh, Tesla in tons of other ESG strategies. It's probably the most polarizing company in the world. And every meeting we have either is a giant champion or the first question is, do you own Tesla? Um, and it's just the funniest thing because um, it, it's, because we're not climate only, yeah. Um, because we care about worker safety and racism and companies releasing their diversity data and all this stuff and investment grade credit rating, um, it obviously doesn't make it into our universe at all. Um, and you know, we own companies working on electrification and hydrogen and who've been doing it for a very long time and uh, emissions reductions in vehicles. But their CEO is not cool, so they get no media, um, and we're very happy to <laughs> own those types of companies um, yeah. because electrification and vehicles and all that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I'd argue, as as you would have seen on Twitter, um, subways, public transportation, livable, walkable cities, and bikes um, should all come in front of vehicles. That being said, lots of folks need to commute, so folks need yeah. vehicles, and we need to get batteries up to you know not really bad for extraction and whether it's Samsung or Tesla or whoever GM doesn't matter who does it that that innovation is going to come um, but the idea that one company in the world is some magic bullet to solve climate which is kind of what gets talked about is quite funny um, yeah. so that's my sort of uh, uh, you know it's 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 really interesting and again we don't um, 
it's been an interesting journey because the you know you could argue we were ridiculous for not including Tesla in our portfolio at the beginning, but um, you know we don't we're, we can be really picky. We only hold yeah. 20 companies in the global. We're really selective, and we're not going to look at a company just because everybody else gives it a 100% impact score. And uh, because systems change, isn't one company is not going to solve it. All the big companies in the world will drive innovation across packaging, shipping, uh, reducing their own emissions use, uh, changing the way the workforce commutes, which thankfully COVID took care of that for everybody. Um, it, it's reducing business travel. Uh, you know, all these things uh, also go on top of electrification and carbon capture and renewable energy tools. And to, to leave everything to windmills and batteries ignores the bigger problems, which is, you know, do we need to get everything cheap from China shipped over the ocean and they're, you know, on their coal grid? Could we, you know, rethink things being made locally? Could we rethink the types of plastics that are used in this? Like it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's systems change and there's no single company in the world with any single product alone that will do more than, than this, but the narrative seems to be the opposite. Yes. Yeah. So you're, you're rooting for the revenge of the nerds. <laughs> yeah. We're, I mean, we're rude. We're, I'm, I I know we'll I know we can drive this change across all of our systems um, and we are and the media gets in the way like the economists article um, because the, the companies are doing the work the companies know it's their emissions and their water use and their waste and their diversity and leadership and their average pay they all matter to their business right and you know, in a nutshell, our companies understand that the positive impact that they make on their stakeholders drives their bottom line. And the more companies, big and small, that we can have doing that, which is, you know, a good chunk of companies, um, the, the more positive impact we'll have. Uh, and, and that's why corporations do play a role um, yeah, in its, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I mean, we know, I mean, for a long time now, companies have known it's it's almost like an employee market out there there's it's and, and with covid yeah it's been even harder to find people so you you as a firm need as a corporation need to have a lot of purpose uh you know demonstrated and um communicated in order to attract young talent today um it's becoming yeah. even, you know uh, yeah. an epidemic I'm, in its own right <laughs> yeah and uh you know i've it's to, to me, it's been been fascinating to watch this whole labor shortage thing unfold. I mean, yes, the pandemic had something to do with it, but we've seen it coming for a de for decades. Mm. You know, this big, huge cohort of baby boomers, which I'm part of, has been moving through the labor force and it's falling out the other side. This is not news. This is not surprise. So why corporations, governments, employers of all stripes weren't better prepared for it. I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I, I find it annoying and amusing at, at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We've been going for just about an hour here, just over an hour. So I'm going to ask last question. And uh, where does the industry go from here? Well, I think uh, the, I think it's we're moving in the direction of mainstreaming these issues. Uh, and I think that's it's going to be interesting to see the evolution in terms of data, how it's integrated, how we start, you know, how we continue to think about it, what's going to happen to all these firms that have built up around ESG um, and how, you know, more and more people are going to be thinking about it and um, digesting it. It's becoming more and more and more important every minute. Um, yeah. So where do we go? I think, yeah, I think it's just going to become part of the DNA more and more. Yeah. yeah no, it's, it's, it, very few it, people are today arguing. It's like, it's still like, you know, are people arguing that climate change is really happening? Um, you know, or that, the, you know, I don't, there's not that many people arguing that anymore. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's now it's just a question of, you know, how and who and what and where. 
Um, so same with ESG data. It's like it can't be ignored. It's it's absolutely essential. How do we integrate it? How can we do a better yeah. job? Yeah. Liz, where are we where are we going? How do we I get there? Think, I think the attacks on ESG just prove that, you know, it's getting closer and closer to be mainstreamed. And mainstream is going to be companies required reporting in their financials, their basic workforce data, their pay equity, their pay level, their water use, their emissions, their waste disposal and recycling, their employee safety data, all that kind of hard data. And more importantly, integrating non-financial risks into that reporting as opposed to having a separate section right and and i think good companies and good portfolio managers have always done that and have always looked at it in in standardization of esg data gives us harder quantitative and even qualitative data around that for corporate management or security selection so I mean, I'm like super optimistic um, of the not not the greenwashing mainstream of this, but the big asset managers not releasing their diversity data, finally realizing they actually have to release their diversity data and that driving change in the investment industry so that we can go from 10 percent woman portfolio managers in Canada to 20 and maybe 30 before I die. And nothing that is not going to happen without the the even further standardization of this data and the folks selling ESG products realizing it applies to them because we as an industry are behind industrials. We're behind even tech and tech is awful. We're behind and, and you know, it, it's in Canada where we have such an oligopoly and such large um, profit profitable investment adjacent firms that will drive economic change. Right. The more women in the workforce, the more women in senior roles, the more non-traditional folks in those roles, um, you know, will drive not only they won't it won't just make us feel good. It will drive economic productivity and reduce risk, all these things um, and, and drive change. Great. Well, you know what? I'd really like to thank both of you for joining me today. It's been a fascinating conversation. We'll have to do it again. Um, yeah, well, just thank you very much. Um, get back out there. Enjoy your beautiful summer day and yeah. uh, we will stay in touch. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Russ. Thank you.